Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. You know, it's amazing how uh, life can get so busy and can, you know, can crash in against us and, um, and, and cause us not to be in the house of the Lord because we're so busy doing other things. And of course, it's a football season and, um, and everybody's going crazy. It's all about football, football. The world's at war, but we've got a lot of men kicking balls around and the world's giving all their attention. Football has become an idol to so many people. And, um, and of course, the two most famous footballers, probably who, maybe they're a bit old now, but they were Messi and Ronaldo. And um, these two were always fighting against one another. Who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm the best. I'm the best. And they go with the ratings. And you've maybe got a, an idea if you follow football or not. But I remember they were interviewing Ronaldo, and, and Ronaldo, you know, I mean, Ronaldo obviously at that particular time, he was, he's, you've seen that man physically, uh, what a physical specimen, what a phenomenal football player. And he believes he's the best, and he says, God sent me, he says, God gave me this gift and sent, and, and has given this to me to be on this earth, to teach football, to show people how the game should be played. And he's full of himself, and he says, so, so God has given me this gift, and God has sent me here to be an example, to be the greatest football player. And I was like, they're poor. So, so fast forward that week, they, they were interviewing Messi, and he says, listen, Messi. He says, you know, you and Ronaldo, you know, and you know, you're both claiming that you'll be the, you're the best player in the world. Did you hear what Ronaldo said? Messi says, no. He says, Ronaldo claimed that he is a gift from God sent to this world. He says, God sent him into this world to be the best footballer and to show his skills to the world. And Messi says, I don't recall sending him. <laughs> that was great. Yeah, I got that off the internet. <laughs> if you get that one, don't you? Hallelujah. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to carry on the theme of last days. <clears throat> Uh, because the reason I'm doing this is because I think it's very important that we get a grasp the days that we're living in. I think sometimes we can be so preoccupied and distracted by the things of this world that we don't actually know the signs and the times of the, of the season in which we're living in. I think the consensus would be with, within many great theologians and uh, church people that we are living in the last days. You know, we're coming back through the streets of Glasgow and I, I've phoned up my friend Mickey Mickey just comes and, you know, he comes and he cuts my hair or wherever I am. So I says, meet me at the church at seven o'clock. And um, so coming back from Glasgow, the time I got here, did a little bit of study ahead of today. And then Mickey came in and cut my hair. And, um, and talking to Mickey, you know, Mickey is um, you know, the man that his brother took his life. And um, he just couldn't cope, struggled to cope. So he went to Canada for three weeks. He just really, he just went to pieces, you know. And um, so that was him back. And Talking to Mickey, and you know, Mickey calls us his church, but he's never here. <laughs> so, so I've encouraged him to be here, but you know, and Mickey says, after he says, You feel it, you know, and we were talking about last days, and he says, You know, he says, I feel it. You can, people feel there's something happening today that they, they can sense there's something, a foreboding in the air. There's an atmosphere that people are picking up on now, and people are starting to feel. And that's because the days are getting dark. That's because there's an explosion of demonic activity. It's increasing. Jesus says it will increase as we move towards the latter days. And I think most people are feeling it. Hence the reason they say one in seven people are depressed. And, you know, in Scotland, and, you know, one in seven have got mental, you know, ailments. People are on prescription drugs. People now are just struggling to cope. People are hitting the drink. People are hitting all kinds of things. Why? Because they're, they're just struggling. They, they can't put their finger on it, but there just seems to be this atmosphere that is building up that is going to get far worse, according to Jesus, as we read that last week. So it is very important for us, hallelujah, as we see these days upon us. Remember this, Jesus did say that especially it, it's, it, we're going, as we move into these last days, we move towards the midnight hour. Remember Messiah, Jesus said, I come like a thief in the night. Hallelujah. That means he comes like a thief in the night that maybe sometimes you'll be caught unawares. That's why Jesus says, beware, take, take notice, because I come like a thief in the night. I come unexpectedly when you might not expect it. Well, that's for those who might be a little bit asleep. You know, our Orthodox Jews today, and I will say Orthodox, as I brought out last week, there's probably 40 odd percent of the Israeli population are secular. They don't do God. They just want to have fun. I've spoken to them in Tel Aviv. Look, mate, we just want to, I'm just out here to party, have a good time. I want to have a nice car. I want a nice house. I want nice women. I says, 
we're not the heat bangers down there in Jerusalem. That was the language. Listen, I spoke to many of them. They're, they're out there. You go to their beaches. You might as well be in some of the exotic beaches around the world. You'll see everything you see there. You'll see there as well. And I'm not saying they're all Israelis, but there'll probably be an awful lot of them there. They're a very secular bunch, and they're reveling it, and they're cheering, cheering themselves on. But the Orthodox Jews, they are praying very hard that their Messiah will come. You know, they're praying that their Messiah will come and rescue them at this time. There's a lot of prayers going up for the Messiah to come because they believe the Messiah, when he comes, will build the third temple, setting themselves up for a great deception of the Antichrist who will come and probably facilitate that for them. And maybe a lot of them will be taken in. The Muslims are praying very hard just now for their Mahdi to come, or their Messiah. And they're praying, send the Mahdi. Send them, send them, come, come, come. And, and, and they see themselves, they're going to rule the world. And don't forget, they, they recognize Jesus as well. And, and he's going to come back and he's going to have words with us Christians. How dare we, dare we call him the son of God. He's coming back as one of a great prophet for, for Allah and Muhammad is coming after him as well. So they're praying. And I was just saying, how much more should we also be praying that Jesus comes? Come, Lord Jesus. That our Messiah comes and, and sorts this world in order and deals with all the wickedness. And we will be caught up to meet him in the air. How should we not be praying? Come, Lord Jesus, come. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. You know, one of the last verses in the book of Revelation 22, 20, it says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Revelation 22, 20. Our only hope is we need the Lord. We need an intervention from the living God like never before that he will come and deal with this wicked world. Hallelujah. And righteousness and the glory of God will fill the world. This is our great cry. As we move into these last days, we should be looking forward to that. My text today actually is going to be Matthew again, 24. And we're going to be looking at the parable of the fig tree. And this was a parable, if you like. This was what really kicked off last week, the last days. And, um, and, and this was the one verse, that, uh, this parable that actually caused me to be thinking that over the last couple of weeks. And it's a parable of the fig tree. And what we realize in here, and many people would say, and many people would dispute it, could this parable be represents Israel's rebirth in 1948? Now, there's a lot of people who would, would agree with that, and there's a lot of people who disagree with it, and I'm talking within Christianity. People say, no, that is, that is not referring to the rebirth of Israel, and it's not referring to the Israelites coming alive again in 1948, becoming a nation in 1948. While I was um, preparing all this, let us, remember, let us remember parables are coded messages that need to be deciphered, interpreted, or decoded. Amen? And that depends on who is reading it. Are we reading it correct? Is, is, is this what God is meaning? Is this what the Lord Jesus was inferring to? Was it or was it not? And, 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 and well, all of us have been given an, an opportunity to either agree or to disagree, or we could have our own opinion about this word. Again, though, what we have to hear is by the Spirit, what is the Lord inferring to? Because don't forget, he's speaking about the last days. And while I was all musing all over this, and without a word of a lie, I'm, I'm driving up. I was going up to Costco through Glasgow. I was just going over the Kingston Bridge, and there was a car in front of me, and the registration, the first part of the registration was FIG 48. Now, I'm not saying that was a sign from heaven. It just maybe just a coincidence. I was of that ilk, and there it was, FIG 48. And I just said, Lord, are you speaking to me? Is, is, are you, are you, are you, are you? Is this a message? Are you just saying I'm on the right track? Because obviously I'm on the track that I believe this scripture is inferring to the rebirth of Israel in 1948. Jesus speaking about the last days and he gives that illustration. Let us just read that again this morning. In verse 32, 24 in Matthew, it says this, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. So you also, when you see all of these things, know that it is near at the very doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Now, Jesus is speaking these parables. Now, don't forget these parables. There's truth in these parables, and we need to find out what is the Lord inferring to. Is this given an illustration that when Jerusalem, when Israel is brought back to the land, and after 1,900 years of wandering, of being put 
to the flight to the old nations when the Roman Empire conquered them in AD 70. And then there was another great uh, conquering in, in AD 132. Bar Kochba, another man that rose up against them. And that's when they were totally flung and banished into the nations. You know, is this now a fulfillment when they came back 1,900 years approximately? And don't forget, they were dribbling back up to then. And there always was a little remnant in the land. There were always a, a presence. But on the whole, when they came flooding back, is the Lord bringing reference to this? Now, what we have to see here, the fig tree is a representative tree. For the Bible speaks about three main trees that he associates with Israel. There's the olive tree, which is associated with the nation of Israel. We have many illustrations through the Old Testament. And there is the vine. Jesus speaks about that as well. The Old Testament speaks about the vine. God says, I took a vine and I planted it in Israel. And it grew and it blossomed. So God does speak three figurative trees. But the fig tree, very clearly, he speaks about Jeremiah 24 and Jeremiah the vision. And he says, what do you see? He says, I see two baskets of figs. Figs, the fruit figs. And he says, one basket, very good figs. And one basket, very poor figs. The good are very good and the bad are very bad. And the Lord is, is illustrating again the, 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 those who are faithful to him in Israel and those who are unfaithful. The ones that he had banished were the ones that he was going to take care of and bring them back. And the ones who remained in the land were the poor ones that judgment of God was going to come upon them. So we see that clearly. Hosea 9 and 10 says this again. You can just look that for yourself. The, the Lord speaking here is through the prophet says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. Hence the reason the vine. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. So the Lord again is drawing reference to figs, speaking about his nation and his people Israel. I found them as the first fruits in its first season, your fathers, when he found them and established them. Now Mark also tells us that prior to the parable of the fig tree here in Matthew 24, that Jesus cursed a tree when he first came into Jerusalem, when he rode into Jerusalem in power, the Bible says he went back out at night. When he came back in in the morning, he seen a tree in the distance. You know the story. You'll see that in Mark. And it says he seen that there was leaves and he went to find some fruit in it and there was no fruit. And Jesus cursed the tree and he spoke to it and says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And then in the morning, the next day we come back in, Peter says, Lord, the, that tree you spoke to, look, it's, it's dead. You know, it's withered from the roots up. And of course, Jesus makes a remark on this and says, and he draws attention to that and he uses an illustration of faith. He says, assuredly, you can say to this mountain, be you uplifted and fly into the sea. And if it does not, you know, and, and, and it will be done for you. If you've got faith, you can move mountains. Therefore, he was just making reference that he spoke to the tree. And that was one, maybe an example of faith. But obviously, Jesus did not just talk, cussed a tree just to show them faith. You know, there was obviously, he used it as an example. There was something other that the Lord Jesus was inferring to. Here he comes into Jerusalem, and the, that figurative speaking to the tree, Israel were rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ, and that their rejection of him, he cursed the tree. Hallelujah. That tree was now cursed, because they were not going to receive him as their Messiah. Hallelujah. That, we can probably see that pretty clear. And we can see that parable also. We see another example of the fig tree here as well. Luke tells us includes a fig tree in another parable in Luke's gospel. Can I also say the three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all include the parable of the fig tree, the three of them. So that would tell us there's something important about that parable in the last days because the three of them include that parable like that fig tree that I spoke to is in Mark. Let's just go to Luke chapter 13. It's important we get a grasp of the word, brothers and sisters, and, um, and I trust that you get a little grasp and hear where I'm going with this as well. So Luke 13, and we'll read from verse 6. It's another parable, and the parable is the parable of the barren fig tree. Again, it's fig tree. It says, you also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit in it, and he found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I have found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, then you can cut it down. So we can see here again the example of a fig tree, and then later in the ministry of the Lord. Don't forget the Lord Jesus' ministry was three, three and a half years. 
And for three and a half years, he would have been to Jerusalem and all the feasts, and he would have been constantly coming back and forth in the land of Israel and looking for fruit, but he did not find fruit within the Jewish communities. And we're looking at the bigger picture within the religious establishment. And he says, cut it down. But there was a period of grace. There was a period of grace. So even though the Lord says, you know, that Israel had rejected the Messiah and judgment was coming, there was a period of grace, but eventually came, AD 70, Titus came and sacked Rome, and then there was another sacking of, of, of Jerusalem completely when another false Messiah rose up, claimed to be the Messiah, and again, they were conquered, AD 132, thereabouts, Bar Kochba was this man, and that was him flung into the four corners of the heavens. So we see here again that the fig tree has been used in the scriptures there. Matthew 24, and we'll read from verse 36. Let me just go up here now, back over to Matthew. We're all dealing with these latter days there as well. So let's just read from verse 36. Matthew 24, verse 36. And again, just to encourage the brethren that nobody knows the hour. None of us know the hour. And Jesus says this. But on that day that after the parable of the fig tree, he says, but on that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also the coming of the Son of Man will be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. They did, not, they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will take and another left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taking and the other left. Watch therefore, then you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, would he, have, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you, are re you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Now we have to be caref careful, friends. The Bible is very clear. Jesus is coming at an hour we do not know. You may, you may be living your life thinking, I've got my whole life in front of me, everything's fine. I'm just going around my life. I've got all the time in the world. Well, unfortunately, you've not got all the time in the world because your time is limited. God has limited time. And especially when we go to these last days. I know people say, oh, they've been telling Jesus, they've been saying Jesus came back for forever, hundreds and thousands of years. He's coming back, he's coming back, he's coming back. And look, I'm just getting on my life. I'll tell you this, the day is coming, he's going to come and it'll just be like a trap. It'll be like a trap suddenly. Choo! That's it. Quickly as that. And he emphasized Noah. You know, Noah was building an ark, the some say, for 120 years, and he was a great uh, evangelist, and he was a great witness to the people. What's this crazy man doing? Because it had never rained before. The, the God watered the earth. The water came up in the ground and came up in as dew and watered the earth. And, and, you know, and it was an example that God was going to judge the world. And people would have been mocking and laughing 120 years. Ah, you know, it's like, you know, people. And then it says the day came. It says when God put him into the ark, and it says God himself shut the door. That was it, it was shut. Door was closed. And then it started to rain. Then the heavens opened up. And the grain got up more and more. And I could imagine a lot of people would have been running, banging on it, clawing onto that ark, trying to get in. But it was too late. It was too late. When he comes, and he comes quickly, like a thief in the night, and he comes to receive us, my friends, it'll be too late for you to say, oh, oh, well, oh. sorry, it's too late. The door's shut. You missed it. You've missed it. It's not right, okay, well, hang on. You've missed it. He will come at a set time, and that time's come and gone, and you'll be left, you'll be left now, that's it, it's gone, and even though you know, but, but I thought, that's too late, I'm sorry, you, you, you know, you were, you were playing the fool in the world, the world, you were in the world, you were distracted with the things of the world, you, you were not interested in me, you hardly gave me any time, you were caught up in the football, you were caught up in the, in the, the bigger and the better, you were caught up in this life, you were caught up in all the things of the world, and you gave no attention to me, and the days came, and it came like that, and all of a sudden now, it's gone. The moment is gone. And that will happen for many, many, many people. And how, what a sad day that will be. Hence the reason I'm on this theme to say, I believe we're living in the last days. I believe we're living in the last days. It's closer now than it's ever been. And this is days, my friend, it's not just a case. It's like, I want to make sure that I want, to, I want a good welcome again to the kingdom of God. I don't want to just get in with the skin of my teeth. <laughs> Thank God, I just get in. And it's like, and the Lord will say, what did you do for me? Um, well, not a lot, really. No, I want to get in there and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been busy about your master's business. Hallelujah, glory to God. I could have been doing, I could have been doing stacks of things yesterday, friends. 
than get up there. I knew it was going to be a poor attendance. I knew it wasn't going to be a great event. But there was a man that asked me, and I wanted to encourage that man, a man called Alex. Just a, just a, a normal guy, Catholic background. But he wanted to do this. He wanted to put this march on. I said, well, I'm too busy. I've got, I mean, I could, be, I could be out in the park or da-da-da. But I thought, no, I'm going to encourage him. And I went there and I walked miles and I thought, where the heck are we going here? I made a remark and we got to Kelvin Grove for a minute. I feel as if I've just crossed the wilderness. I feel as if I've just entered the promised land. I went, for goodness sake. It was about an hour and a half. And then, of course, the person that was leading us was very, was, was very orderly because every time they'd be going a red light, they would stand there like that waiting for the green man. I'm like, last day, cars are out. Let's go, move. Let's get there to get back. I had to just, patience is a virtue. I think eventually I just took the lead. I walked up and went, come on, let's get across here. The green man seemed to be keeping forever. The Hulk, I don't know where he was. But praise the Lord. But I said, I'm walking for the glory of God. Hallelujah. And I, I'm being busy about my master's business. And I want to be found. Hallelujah. And I'm not saying we can't go and enjoy life, brethren. But I'm just saying we can step up for the moments. Glory to God. But we see these things happening here, being busy about, hallelujah. Now, Jesus tells us this, boy, why to be, to be vigilant, to be busy about our master's business. I want to be busy about God's business. It's so easy to get caught up in this world, friends, and this world is passing on. This world is coming to a close. Everything you think you've got is going to go one day. It's just going to go, shoop. I don't care if you live in the penthouse. I don't care if you've done this and that. I don't care if you've got all the, the initials after your name, PhDs and whatever, doctor this and reverend that. I don't care if you own large areas of land and your Rolls Royces and your garages are full. That means nothing. Nothing. It's passing away. It's gone. Nothing. It, it will mean nothing. God's not going to say, well, I was pretty impressed there with your, your cars. It's all about the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of God now. We're called to be in the kingdom. Well, yes, we work, friends. Yes, we, we have to make a living. Yes, we're out there and, and doing these things. And you have to take that in context. But in the midst of all that I'm doing, I should be, people should be looking at me. I should be an example for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Busy about the master's business, which is the kingdom of God. That's what we're busy about. It's not the kingdom of man. It's the kingdom of God. We're busy about the master's business. And we should always be on call. Mark also tells us to what Jesus says. In, and Mark, again, it says, watch and pray, lest you find yourself sleeping. Mark tells us that. And Mark, when he goes into, talks about the last days in Mark's gospel. Jesus says, watch and pray, lest he find you sleeping. Is the church asleep today? Many people say that's a sleeping giant. It's, it, it needs to be woken up. It's asleep. It's been lullaby to sleep. Lullaby baby on the sweet top. I remember doing that with my kids, you know, get to sleep. And Satan's put us to sleep. He's robbed us. And he's, and he's nicely, just keep them sleeping, just keep them asleep, keep them, just keep them amused, keep them preoccupied. Keeping away from the master's business. I'll just keep them nice. And so we're, we're just out there and we're not really focused. Isn't it Mark says in Mark's gospel says, look, you know, it says there, be, be vigilant, hallelujah. You know, don't be, don't be found asleep. Glory to God. Interesting, just a little while later, a couple of days later in the garden of Gethsemane, his three most trusted disciples, Peter, James, and John, at the, at the hour, the late hour, the midnight hour, when all hell was breaking loose, guess what? They fell asleep. And the Lord had to come and rebuke them and says, could you not pray with me? Could you not be in prayer and standing with me at this hour, watching and praying? He says, watch and pray. Watch and pray. And the Lord then, and so even though we see that, we, we see that they were asleep when they should have been alert. And we know there, and you know, on there, Jesus again is encouraging us. Glory to God. They were exhausted, you see. Sometimes I feel myself exhausted. Do you ever feel exhausted? And you just, and you're falling asleep. Usually it's when you're wanting to pray, isn't it? I mean, I've seen me have been too exhausted and I'm ready to fall asleep. And then see, suddenly if I just put that, there'll be Facebook and start flipping through. All of a sudden, I've, it's, is it me? It's just kind of, it's like, all of a sudden, it's about an adrenaline kicks in. It's like, it kind of wakens you up. And yet you want to turn to this word, and it's like, you find yourself snoozing. 
It's amazing how, though, that it's, it's just how it works. You have to be determined in the realm of the spirit and I'm having to give myself a good shake and I do that often. I'm, though, I'm still feeling that. But nobody, nobody knows again, friends, the day or the hour. That's what he says there. But those who are wise will know the season, the signs of the times. Therefore, what are the signs of the times? Jesus was actually speaking about these are the signs of the times. Wars, famines, pestilence. He was given that... Here, I tell you beforehand, this is what you need to look out to. He was specifically speaking of the latter days. I brought a suggestion that maybe he was talking to an Israelite community, hence the reason when he was speaking in Matthew 24. And it says, and then in one verse that really caught me, it says, and all the nations will hate you. And I'm seeing today, like never before, the spirit of anti-Semitism across the nations. I've never seen it. Well, I mean, not that I've lived that long, I'm 64. But it seems as if it's in such an intensity just now Probably the last time we seen it under Hitler and he then, the propaganda machine kicked in and everybody kicked off and there was this kind of dislike to the Jews. It's been there down through the centuries. But now we live in this day, the amazing, the hatred across the nations, America, Britain, different places. Even within Christian community. Well, whew, Jews, I know that special, are they? Well, that's something that we'll have to be looking at. Who is really special? Obviously, the Bible says they were special because God called them and he set them apart as his own people. We've got it all over the Old Testament. Some people think we get to the new, God's finished with them. No, God cut them off, but he's going to reinstate them again. Hence the reason, the parables of the fig tree. But on that lateness of the hour, again, this Jesus, well, Jesus says this, Revelation 16 and 15, the one verse says this, Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and to be shamefully exposed. Again, we see that in the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to, to us, his people. I come like a, don't, you know, be careful, hallelujah, that you, you're not going to be unclothed, that you go about naked and be shamefully exposed. I remember I'm through a wee spell, it was probably last year ago. Have you ever had a dream and in the dream you're naked? And you're that embarrassed. <laughs> Maybe you haven't. It was a dream. And in this dream, I don't know where I was, but I was kind of, I was in, I was somewhere anyway, and, and I was I was I was kind of I was naked. I went, for goodness sake, and I'm like, I was so embarrassed, and I was hiding behind a bin or something like that. And I went, mean, how am I gonna how am I gonna get over there? Because I had no clothes on. And I kind of woke up and I just started to think, hang on a sec here, you know, a lot of you speaking to me. You know, are, are you showing me something? That maybe I'm not where I should be. You know, the amplified version of that verse says this, Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and who keeps his clothes. That is, stays spiritually ready for the Lord's return, so that he will not be naked, spiritually unprepared, and men will not see his shame. Interestingly enough, isn't it, that Adam and Eve were found to be naked, and guess what? They covered them naked with fig leaves. You know, I, thought, you know, I thought it was interesting again, talking about the fig tree. Adam and Eve, when they were sinned, and all of a sudden realized they were what? They were naked now. And they hid from the presence of God, and they covered their, their nakedness with fig leaves. Do you think that's just another example there? Is where the fig leaves tried to cover themselves, plus they hid from the Lord. Listen, when you're not living right before the Lord, you will be ducking and diving. You will be a little bit distant. You don't want to get too close to God. You know why? Because I know that I've got sin in my life. And I cannot come close to God because I know that I'm not living right. Amen. Unless, of course, your heart becomes seared and you don't think, I don't give a monkey's. I'm fine. God loves me. Hallelujah. And you love your life anyhow. And you think you're the bees and E's. Well, well, one day you'll stand before God and you'll have to explain the bees and E's hiding from the presence of God. And God rebukes him, doesn't it? Hallelujah. There's one verse here in Hebrews 4.13. And it says this. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. All of us will give an account. God sees right through you. God sees everything. You can't hide anything. He knows every thought. Is that not scary? He knows us Completely. When we stand before him that day, we go, oh, but, but, but I would, I would, sure, those pathetic excuses that we tend to give to one another, they'll, they'll, they'll just, you won't be able to say a thing. You'll be standing there in the presence of God and the miraculous brilliance light of God and you will be exposed. You will be totally and utterly exposed and you will not be able to say one word. You will be exposed of how you lived your life before him, for him and for his glory. Amen. 
And you'll just you'll have to stand there in that glorious light, hallelujah. It's like taking an X-ray and it goes right through you and it's like skeletons. <laughs> How much more so the light of the Lord? Let me see how the time is. Praise the Lord. I've got time here again, so let me just go, because I want to be finishing this week. I'm not wanting to be put out as I'm making the case, friends, that I believe Israel is a major sign today. I'm making the case, and maybe not everybody will agree with that, but the bottom line is, is the Bible, is the Bible, is this is what the Bible is alluding to? Is this what Jesus is alluding to? Amen. You make up your mind. A lot of people, a lot of very you know, qualified people will believe this, and very qualified people will not believe this and say this is nonsense. And they'll say, this is nonsense. I, I tend to feel that, that I, I believe this. I believe God is making a reference to Israel when they came back in 1948. And that's what the major sign that we are moving now to the latter days. Hallelujah. That would be a major sign. If we flip over the page into Matthew and um, 24, and we get again the, the foolish virgins. Uh, we won't get into that part, but again, he's speaking about those who get oil and those who get the extra oil. All of them were waiting for the bridegroom and some were foolish and some were wise. The wise had a full tank, but the foolish ones had probably less than a full tank, had a half a tank. And when, when the Lord, when, when, it, when it came, midnight hour, again, midnight hour, when least expected, the word went out. He's come, and, and the those who were low in oil, they had to go and get extra oil, but those who had this, enough oil were able to go immediately and be with that. And of course, that's probably making reference to the Holy Spirit. Can I just bust a few bubbles? See, for you Christians who think you're filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, shaka ndi ka mama dora ki mama dora ka sho shinda ra baba dora si mama ka ka ya lara ki mama dora shinda ra pako ki da. And you say I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. You are deceived, my friends. Hallelujah. You are deceived. You'll be filled with the Holy Spirit to the extent you will decrease in yourself and get rid of your own nature, then the Holy Spirit will be able to fill you a little bit more. That says be filled and be continually filled. Amen. And to the degree of being filled with the Holy Spirit, we can read that in the scripture, Stephen was a man filled with the Holy Spirit. Disciples filled with the Holy Spirit. Friends, I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, I've got a measure of the Holy Spirit but a desire to create more room that I can embrace more of the Spirit of God working in me and working through me, hallelujah. I need to make room. And when I start to make room, the Holy Spirit then can make room in me, amen. And there's a place that we have to give. It's give and take. As we give, then the Lord will take. As I give of myself, then the Lord will take that, hallelujah, and, t- and possess a little bit more of me. Now, I don't want to be undermining this, guys. It's not here to give us a hard time. It's all I'm saying is, let us look at the scriptures. We have to be vigilant in these days. Glory to God. Talents as well has been busy about the master's business. Then we're going to go into another contentious portion of scripture. And it is when the Son of Man will judge the nations. Amen. Be the sheep and the goat nations. And you read that from verse 25, verse 31, reading through then to 46. Glory to God. And that's when he starts to say, he says, you know, he puts the sheep, he separates some sheep and goats. And then he begins to say it to those, then the king will say to those in his right hand, the sheep, come, blessed my father and heir of the kingdom, prepared for the foundations of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you, gave, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to, to me. The righteous will say, well, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When do we see you as a stranger and take you in naked and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer, I say, surely I say to you, as much as you've done this to the least of one of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. And then he will say to the other ones, depart from me. He says, you know, when I was in prison, you didn't come and visit me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was sick, you never ministered to me. And then, it's, and then it says, well, Lord, when, when? Of course, they were, they says, when did we see, you know, see you thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick? And we did not minister to you. He says, I tell you the truth, as much as you did not do it to these, the least of my brethren, you did not do it to me. Then those will be taken away into lasting punishment, the righteous into eternal life. Now, many people believe that actually the Lord Jesus Christ, when he says, These my brethren, he's speaking about the Jewish people. He's speaking about the Jewish, the Jewish brethren. Listen, Jesus was a Jew. Amen. He was a Jew from the tribe of Judah. 100%, 100% trace these lineage. That's why we've got the, the, the lineage of Christ all the way back. Hallelujah. He was a Jew. And some people believe then, and I'm one of them. The Hebrew, when he says, when you didn't do this, the least of my brethren, you did not do it to me. And he's referring to how we treat 
the Jewish nation and people. Don't forget the, at the start of this, this is him, he's going to be judging nations. He's going to be judging nations. Now I know that there's a part when we take care of the poor, we're blessing the Lord, and we're taking care of the poor, we're loving Jesus Christ. That's all in there as well. But don't forget, the caption is he's speaking to nations. Now let me draw a line. I don't like to just have one little portion of scripture and we think, oh, that's, that's whatever. Let's go back to the book of Joel. Because don't forget that the old is in, the new is in the old and the old is displayed in the new. So let's go to the book of Joel and we can read from Joel's gospel here. And it goes, God is going to judge the nations. Chapter three, have you got that in the head? And God is going to judge the nations. What I read to is there in Matthew's gospel, again, it says God's going to judge the nations at the end of days. And it's going to be then how they treated, I believe, the Jewish nation and the Jewish people. So let's go to this. It says, Behold, in those days at that time, when I bring back the captives, speaking about Israel, of Judah and Jerusalem, makes it very clear, I will also gather all the nations, and I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment there with them, on account of my people, my inheritance, Israel, whom they scattered amongst the nations. They've been scattered amongst the nations. They've also divided up my land, and they cast lots for my people. They've given a boy his payment for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Indeed, you do too with me of Tyre and Sidon and all the coasts of Felicita. Will you re re retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me swiftly and speedily, I will return to you my retaliation upon your own head. Because you have taken my silver and my gold, you carried away from my temples, my prized possessions. Also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem, you sold them to the Greeks that you made them far from their borders. And then it goes on to say this. So then, here we go. So Matthew 25, and the Lord's speaking again when he's going to judge the nations and, and the way they are treated Israel is speaking about the last days. Amen. So Jesus came to fulfill the old, and we see that in the new. So we can see here in the book of Joel, talking about the last days, that God's going to judge the nations and how they treated the Jewish nation. Amen. Now we can fast forward it to today. Hallelujah. And we're starting to see nations now who are actually turning their back against Israel. Nations now that are actually now, you know, resisting and decrying Israel to say, they're not God's people. They, they rejected Christ. Therefore, you know, they were, they, were, they were God's people up to Christ came. Now Christ made a new covenant. They're, they're yesterday's people. It's called replacement theology. As if Israel's got no part to play in the last days. Israel's got every part to play in the last days. I've said it. I said it for this pulpit and I'll say it again. Israel is center stage for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. As he was for the first coming, he is center stage for the second coming of the Messiah. He is coming back and he's coming back not to Britain, not to Ireland, not to Paris. He's coming back to Jerusalem. He's coming back to the Mount of Olives. It says, every eye will see and every eye will see. He's coming back to Jerusalem and he's coming back to the Jewish nation. And he's going to redeem that nation. That nation's going to cry out for him. That nation's going to embrace him. That nation is going to receive him as their Lord and their Savior. And there'll be great mourning in Israel. And we can see pictures of that all the way through the Old Testament. Joseph went away into Egypt and, they, and, and, and his brothers did not recognize him. Do you remember them when his brothers come and are living in fulfillment of the vision? And then Joseph takes, his, takes, takes the veil off, if you like. I'm Joseph. I'm Joseph. And they fall before him. And they embrace him as a brother. That day is coming, and that's going to be a picture in the latter days because the Gentiles embraced the Messiah, but the Jews rejected him. But the day is coming when God is going to turn back to the Jews. This is the number one sign that we are living in these days, brethren. And I wanted to emphasize that. The reason I'm emphasizing that, because I want to say this, the spirit of anti-Semitism is alive and well. I'm speaking to people all the time, even a lot of Christians. Even a lot of Christians who, you know, they're maybe not over there wanting to be throwing stones at them or throwing rockets at them and screaming at them. But the very fact that you say you're not God's people is a spirit of anti-Semitism. That's what you've got just now. That's it. You've got the spirit of anti-Semitism. It's on you because you're saying, no, no, you, no we, we don't recognize you. It's not if you recognize them or not. Does God recognize them? Can I say as we move into these last days, God is moving in this land and we can already see this taking place before our eyes. It's happening before our eyes. The spirit of anti-Semitism has never been so rife. Nations are screaming out against Israel. Everybody's coming against them 
And the days will come probably when the nations of the world will gang up against them and they'll probably go there. And there's many other things. Guys, can I just also go back to Genesis 12, 1 to 3? And this is what the Lord says to Abraham. Amen. And I brought that out last week as well. I just want to reinforce it because I'm not going to be going there next week. I just want to let you know exactly where I stand. And this, as a pastor of the church, this is what I'm teaching. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now you either have every right to accept that or to say, okay, pastor, or I'll look into it. Or you can say, I reject that. That is, you have every right to do this. And remember, God's promises to Abraham are eternal promises. Amen. They didn't come to an end, you know, when Jesus came. They did not come to an end. They were eternal promises, taking us to the end of time. And the Lord says this to Abram, get out of your country from your family, from your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Henceforward, we go to the end of time here when the Lord now is going to bring the nations before him. Did you bless them or did you curse them? Were you a blessing to them? Did you help them in the time of their great need or did you reject them or did you just turn against them? This is the way that I see the world is going just now and I think we're fast forwarding it now as we move into these days. Can I just finish with this? Here's a cracking example, okay? But if you don't quite get it. I'm a father, I've got children. Let's just say my son Ben, he's not here today anyway. Say my son Ben just rejects me and we have a massive fallout, and he says, see you, I'm off. And I'll, you'll never see me again. It's a massive fallout, and he just goes, and he, and he goes away, and he's, he's away. While he's away, I'm, I'm, I adopt, I adopt some children, okay? Because I wanted children. So I adopt some of my children. I adopt these other children. So they're not necessarily mine by, you know, by, you know, by, by, that I've given, you know, that I was involved in their birth, and my seed was involved. I've, I've, I've adopted them, but I've given them every right. They've got every right to be in my house and I've made a will and they are part of that will. They're part of my family now. I've given them my name. I've adopted them and they have my name, but they're adopted children. But the real child is out there and he's, he's out there and he's, 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 he's gone. And then the day comes when that, my, my child, my son comes back again. My son, my real son comes back again. And he says, Father, Father, look, forgive me, Father. I, 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 I just, I rejected you, Dad, and I, I lived a wild life. I didn't want to know you, Dad, and I went away. Dad, please forgive me. And he comes back. Do you think I wouldn't throw my arms around my son, Ben, my real son? But many people think he looks like. Do you think I would not be melted in my heart and embrace my son, even though he rejected me and went away, far away? Do you think I would not throw my arms around him and say, son, and be broken and actually embrace him? This is a scene at the end of days, friend. But see, the thing is, see, the adopted ones, they've been, they've been brought in now. They're in the household. They've got every right to be in the household because I've legally adopted them and I've given them full rights to be in the house. They've got a share in the inheritance. That is a wonderful picture of what God has done to all the families of the world. Whosoever, he came to his own and his own rejected him, John's Gospel, chapter 1. It says, but for all of those who received him, he gave rights to become children of the living God. He adopted them and they get full rights. Hallelujah. So I've got full rights along with the Jews. So therefore, Jew and Gentile now are one in the Messiah. Hear me clearly. One in the Messiah. And every Jew and every Gentile needs to come to God through the Messiah Jesus. Have to come through Jesus. They cannot come through Abraham. They have to come through the Son, who is the glorious one who is coming. Hallelujah. To save all those now who would acknowledge him as the Son of the living God and repent of their sins. Hallelujah. I want to finish with that there as well. Do you see the beauty of the picture of the living God? Do you see how God separated the people Israel and how God has tracked down them down through the centuries right into the New Testament? He is still tracking them and tracking them and tracking them to the point where they came back to the land in 1948. You need to study history, my friends. Do you know the miracle, the miracle of that, 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 that achievement? That they were still kept together as a people? Unless, of course, you say, well, no, they're not really a people. They're all kidneys on. They're all a mic You know, they're not Jews, really. Well, you... 
you know, see if you want to explain something away, and if an attitude against something, you will explain it away. You know, it's like, well, they're not really, they're not really Jews, and it wasn't God that brought them back. It was the Rothschilds. It was, it was all the conspiracy. It was the globalists. How foolish, my friends. Do you think God is now, God's up there struggling and the devil's winning the war? And it's like, God knows exactly what he's doing. And God will use the devil to fulfill his plans and purposes. You see it time and time again. God is in control. God is working and he's weaving everything to the fullness, to the end of days. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And we, we, brethren, now listen to me. Because, listen, I could tell you a lot of stories. I really could. And you think, I didn't get this. I went to Israel once because it was Barry and Batia. No, no, it wasn't Barry and Batia. It was um, God TV channel, Wendy and Alex. Wendy, Alex, and um, Rory. I just became a minister. I was at Braveheart Conference, and there was a special deal going to Israel. 220 quid for Heathrow. I went, oh, that's all right. I'm a minister. Signed up for it. And I went to Israel. When I got there, I had a terrible flu. I was miserable. It was only three days. In fact, it was snowing in Jerusalem. That's how bad it was. You know, and I went there and they, 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 they took us a week and a tour and a couple of people came and spoke to us and were trying to kind of defend their, they, an Israeli politician trying to defend. But listen, nothing. I didn't have a burning bush experience. I had nothing, nothing, right? I came back home in Scotland and I know some, some, something was deposited in me. And it started now a journey. I was going back and forward. I've been back and forward. Do you know that? I've been maybe been there nine times now. There's a love affair. There's something just run me back. And all of a sudden, God deposited something within me. Amen. God deposited with something in me. Are, are they a lovable people? No, just like your people. No, they're no. <laughs> There's nothing, nothing. But I got a recognition. I had a revelation that there's something special with those people. Why? Because God's name's on them. Because God has put his name in them. They can't escape it. That's why it says the nations of the world hate them. Why does the nations of the world hate them? Because God's name, because they carry God's name. And some of them don't even want God's name, but they're stuck with it. Jews. I mean, I'm sure an awful lot of the ones in Germany that Hitler was killing, they, weren't, they, weren't, they didn't want to be Jews. They were, I'm German. I'm, I'm Dutch. I'm Polish. Didn't matter. What's your history, pal? You're a Jew. No, I'm no. Bye-bye. And we can see that over there. Why does the hate Satan hate them down through the centuries? Do you know why? Because God's got a plan and purpose for them. Because they bear the name of God. And some, not very good, I might add. But they still bear it. And see, before we might get two years up with them, look at the state of the church. We bear the name as Christian. Do you think we are great adverts for the Christian faith? I'm looking at the wider picture. But we still carry the name of God. We still carry the name of God. How many times did Jesus say, oh, how long will I put up with you? How long will I, how long will I suffer you? And he says that about the church as well. Thank God for the faithfulness of God knowing that we are weak in the, in, the, in the nature of the flesh, but he sees the end, hallelujah, when he's going to come and he's going to redeem us. Friends, I'm just bringing it out again as the signs of the times and the places we were going. Do not harden your heart and just, you need to see this and you need to read the scriptures. You study the scriptures. And by the way, see if anybody else is thinking, I don't agree with that. See if you don't agree with it. See when you want to come to me, come with the scriptures, right? Come and show me the scriptures that God's finished with Israel. And not just one scripture. Come with a few scriptures and say, God's finished with Israel. There's no getting any part with them. They're yesterday's people. There's, there's, there's nothing special about them. And there's nothing special about the land. Come with the scriptures, okay, friends? Okay? And then I'll bring a load of scriptures out and then we'll, we'll, we'll compare them. Amen? You come with the scriptures and tell me God's finished them and God's not got a part to play with them. Hallelujah. From this book. I'm not interested in any other book. I'm not interested in what's happening with the, with the diehards across the world and the globe. I'm not, you just come with this book because this is the book. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. This is everything that's going to be happening today is coming and it's written in this word and it's going to be unfolded just as he said it would. Hallelujah. Therefore, for us who have put our trust and our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's coming, brethren. Let's get excited. Let's say, come, Lord Jesus. Let's be busy about the master's business. Let's see people coming into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Let's go out there into the highways and the byways and let's shine in lights for the people. Let's be busy about the master's business. But let's take note of the times. Let's not be asleep. It's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to stir ourselves up. Hallelujah. For the glory of God. 
Father, I just thank you afresh today, and I thank you, Lord, I just, as I brought this word, I'll leave it with you, Father, to speak to your people. But Lord, we do pray. We do pray, Father, for your people Israel. We pray, Lord, that their eyes will be opened. We pray, Lord God, that you will soften their hearts. We pray, Lord, that they will see Messiah Jesus, that they will see their King, and they will acknowledge him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and they will bow the knee before him, and they will repent and receive him as their Lord and their Savior. Father, not only do we pray that for them, but we pray it for our own land and for our own nation. We pray, Lord, ahead of this Saturday coming. We pray, Father, for many souls to be saved. We pray for our children, Lord God, to be saved. We pray for household salvation. We pray for Scotland. We pray for Britain. We thank you, Father, what took place in Birmingham. And we're looking, Father, for a double portion. Yes, in Glasgow. We are praying, Father, Lord, that we will see many, Lord God, Father, again, coming and, Lord God, embracing Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. I just pray, Lord, that you will help us to understand the season and the times. I pray that you will wake us up. If we've been asleep, I pray, wake us up to the lateness of the hour. That, Father, we will stop ducking and diving and hiding, Lord God. But, Father, we will stand up to be counted and to be the men and the women that you've asked us to be in your great and glorious name. So I thank you for today, Lord God. Bless your people. And may your word, Lord God, Father, take root in their hearts. And you speak to them by your Holy Spirit, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.